How did it work at the BBC at that time? And, and obviously you went through various kind of um, shows and then you actually get, this is your first um, uh, directing job, which I mean, is an incredibly assured and confident piece of work. <laughs> um, but but how, did you, how, how did you get to the point where you were given the, kind of, you know, the keys to the director's cupboard, so to speak? Um, I struggled, well, as I started, I started as, a, as a runner um, and then three years later became a, an assistant floor manager, like a second and third role together. Um, third, second and third assistant role together. Uh, and then uh, became a first assistant. So all this took 14 years before I became a director. And then I knocked for three years on Graham McDonnell, who was the head of drama serials, door to um, beg him, please give me a chance to go on the director's course. In those days, you had uh, a three-month course at the BBC, or ran, they ran a, a course for selected individuals they thought had some potential um, as directors. Uh, and after that three months, you then were left on your own to send your little goodies uh, on a tape to various producers to see if someone would give you a chance as a director. And eventually, um, Julia Smith, who created EastEnders, was doing a series called Angels, and she gave me my chance as a director um, and gave me a couple of episodes of Angels and then a few more. And then eventually, John Nathan Turner saw some of those angels and thought, OK, we'll give um, Graham a chance. And that's how I got my opportunity. And then, boy, what an opportunity. And moving now on to Matthew, Sarah and Janet, all of you had worked for different lengths of time with Tom Baker in the period leading up to um, The Fifth Doctor. Um, and did you, I mean, were, were you all kind of contracted to kind of pass over and, and, and join The Fifth Doctor? Or at what point did you know, I mean, I guess in... I guess in um, Janet's case, you were right at the very end, so I guess you knew you were coming back. But, but Matthew in particular, did you know that you were going to kind of come oh, back yes, with a new yes. series? And, 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 and how was it kind of adjusting to somebody else in the role? I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. It was, it, was, it was fabulous adjusting to absolutely everything. <laughs> it was. It was gorgeous. Gorgeous. It was. It was a beautiful. No, I mean, Tom was a great... Great Lord Hoover. He was, a, he was an, a, 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 quite a difficult man. Um, and he's been honest about this in the years since. And then Peter swans in from the Yorkshire Dales, and it's all nice and, and cuddly and, and, and a very different kind of atmosphere. So, Does that so, sound fair? Does uh, that sound I'm yes. very nice true? and cuddly, yes, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, John Nathan Turner's shortlist of requirements, apparently for the new Doctor, whether it would be a younger actor to appeal to a youthful audience, should seem vulnerable as opposed to the previous overpowering regeneration, exhibit a more old-fashioned sense of heroism, and have straight hair after Tom Baker's curls. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know... Tick all those boxes? Yeah. Yes. yeah. He does tick those boxes. I had to have my hair dyed red so that I didn't look like Matthew. <laughs> John's list of requirements were always interesting. <laughs> So can you tell us, Peter, about... I mean, we, we, just before, before you arrived, we heard um, Mark Gatiss talking about how the fact that he was convinced that the Fifth, Do fifth Doctor was going to be Lance Percival. <laughs> and then it came to <laughs> end up being you, which he was also very happy about, I'm, I'm pleased to share. Um, but, but can you tell us about getting the role and, and, and how it happened and so forth? Well, it, it came entirely out of the blue. I was just sitting at home one night, and, and John Nathan Turner rang me up and said that... Uh, uh, Tom Baker's leaving Doctor Who. I'd worked with Tom on All Creatures Great and Small about uh, two years before, two, three years before. And I hadn't spoken to him, I think, since then. So why John Nathan Turner was ringing me up and telling me that Tom Baker was leaving, I really couldn't fathom. Because it was the last thing on my mind that I would ever be offered uh, Doctor Who. To me, I suppose, because I, I was the first uh, Doctor Who grew up watching it. Um, William Hartnell and Patrick Trant were my doctors, and I had them sort of set in my mind. As an, act, and as an actor, I'd often thought about getting a part in Doctor Who, but never actually playing the Doctor. And he went on to say, how do you feel about being the next Doctor? And there was a long silence, I remember, because I thought, what do I say? Do I say yes straight away, or do I say, mm, let me think about it, which I, I wasn't thinking. But um, he did then offer to take me out to lunch. And you know that they're serious when the BBC producer offers to take you out for lunch. Uh, and um, over the course of the next week, he persuaded me. I, I did have misgivings because, as I say, I, I you know, I, I'd grown up with the, the part, uh, watching the part, and, and I'd never imagined myself doing it. And he persuaded me that, that I was okay. I had straight hair uh, and was younger. Um, and indeed, he then wanted to highlight my hair to make it even more exciting. Um, <coughs> uh, and um, he persuaded me to do the part. So he came really completely out of the blue. But I do remember 
extraordinary enough, the day it was announced uh, was the day that Ronald Reagan won the US elections. And we were both on the um, on sort of news at 10 together. And I think I was bong headline above Ronald Reagan, actually. It was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty impressive. Uh, and um, at the very, very start of the show, William Hartnell's time, there were three companions. But it had become more traditional for it to be the Doctor and one companion. So how did that work as a kind of dynamic off, off camera in terms of, I mean, what, was, was it a kind of competition amongst yourselves or was it as gorgeous as Matthew suggests that it was? <laughs> it was as gorgeous as Matthew said. Uh, competition off, off camera? No. Did you fight no. a lot? Did we fight no. a lot? No. No. And there's no issue like a script would come through and it's like, well, I've only got two lines, you've got three lines or? No. No, in <laughs> fact, you would sort of give them away. <laughs> <laughs> Please, how often do you say what doctor in this episode? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I've got five, and you've got seven. I'll take one. <laughs> <laughs> then we both got six. We believed in sharing, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what doctor, when doctor, who doctor, you know? Why are we here, doctor? Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean, doctor? <laughs> but you did it so well, Janet. <laughs> what? Yeah, and you never, ever had to say reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. I oh. always said reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. It was <laughs> our biggest joke, wasn't it? It was our biggest <laughs> joke, yeah. Some, some of the people who um, have played um, the Doctor, and I know that obviously your career spans a lot before and after, but have certainly found at the time that, that when they're kind of walking around, they are absolutely kind of like, you know, sort of mobbed, and, and in people's minds, they are the Doctor. I mean, is, it, it, did your kind of... I know that you had success with all creatures great and small and other stuff, but did it change overnight from, in, in terms of the, from the Doctor point of view? Yes, it did. I mean, there is, seems to be no limit uh, to the number of people who will shout from across the road, Oi, mate, where's your TARDIS? <laughs> like, they're the, they're the first people who've ever thought of the line. Um, but it was... Uh, yeah, there was... It, it was... I think it's bigger now. I have to say, but it was fairly extraordinary. Oh, I mean, you would get followed down the street and you, you would have to sneak out of the back of Sorry, shops. Sorry, we don't mean to upstage you. <laughs> Why stop the habit of a lifetime, Janet? <laughs> Wasn't much of a challenge. <laughs> um. beneath, beneath this uh, veneer of insults lies a, a huge, thick uh, morass of affection and love. <laughs> and bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, um, that, that John, um, sorry, the BBC did was they moved it from the sort of traditional Saturday tea time slot and you went out sort of twice a week, which actually ended up working from a ratings point of view, but there was a lot of concern, the big kind of uproar at the time, I think, in the media and so forth. Um, what, I mean, what, what was the feeling sort of generally? Were people very worried about that move? Well, I, I felt, I must admit, I was among those who felt it, was, it should be Saturday tea time because it always had been. Uh, and, um, and indeed... So bloody British. <laughs> well, yes, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. And, uh, no, I don't know. You know, but what I did realise was that I always felt about Doctor Who should be on at that time, but I, I, I had long since stopped watching it. And I think that's part of the reaction that there was. Oh, Doctor Who's got to be on at Saturday tea time. A vast majority of people who, who made that complaint actually didn't sit down and watch it. They knew it was there, and they loved it, the fact it was there, and it was very comforting that Doctor Who was at that point in the evening, but they didn't actually sit down and watch it in the numbers that they, they had done. So it did, it did mean that we had very good viewing figures by changing it to, I guess, what you call a soap opera slot. And Graham, now when you make... Uh, Doctor Who, you're kind of, it's a single camera approach and it's not the kind of the multi-camera sort of studio. Um, um, do, I mean, do, you, do you kind of, do you miss that old, uh, that old way of working? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got myself into, uh, s not with anybody, but myself, with in serious troublemaking caves because um, I, I knew that the way forward um, was to do it single camera. But of course, it, we, that, that was not the way it was going to be. It was multi-camera, and then on film, you did all the single camera work on location, of which there wasn't very much. Um, now, we, we work we're, uh, two cameras most of the time, or, or, or I don't know what it is at this moment, but uh, that's the normal way uh, the, the current series were made on two cameras. Um, and fantastic equipment, and, and, and the look is brilliant and whatever. Uh, there, I decided I would work on the floor, be with the actors and be with all the technicians because of all the... Um, partly because I was afraid to be up in the gallery because I actually 
hated multi-camera, although I was brought up to do that, I actually found it an archaic way of making any programme because it's a compromise from the moment you start. And Doctor Who's a compromise before you start anyway uh, because you're never going to have all your dreams. Uh, you'll get, uh, hopefully, most of them. Um, but I loved the... Um, I, I loved taking the big risk... And I knew I'd lost my job there, but I took a big risk in, stay, in, in going on the floor and running quite a lot of sequences um, on single camera until John Nathan Turner and the clock were ticking and he was saying, I'm sorry, you ain't going to finish, pal, so we'd better go back to the... <coughs> and so I had to do most of it on uh, multi-camera. Um, but uh, quite a bit of it is single camera work. And it's well known, that the story, because it is a great story and it's well written and it looks great, but there's that fantastic performance by Christopher Gable in it. Um, and, and which is real kind of stand out. Uh, where, uh, where did the idea of casting him come from? Um, well, I'd said to John, when we came to cast, talking about casting, I remember saying to John Nathan Turner that whoever was going to play that, they had to have a fantastic... I wanted a deep, rich voice. Well, he's got a pretty good voice. I mean, I'm not sure it's as deep and rich as I originally meant to, it to be. But he had to have a really, really strong and good and attractive voice. Um, Great physique, so because that was all he's going to have, because his face until the end was going to be completely covered, and then his face is covered because it's all full of uh, prosthetics on. Um, so that person, had, the actor, had to have a, a, a fantastic kind of physique, etc. Um, and I couldn't think of any actor who'd want to play that part um, because you never really see them ever at any time. But I thought of Mick Jagger, David Bowie. I think not just me. I mean, he and I tossed ideas around and those were the, the that was the uh, those are the areas we were going and I had worked with Christopher Gable when I was a runner I worked on a show um, when he was a ballet dancer I worked on a show which is a, a music down the middle of the road as it were um, it, it, which was done from Bristol in which every week there were opera singers and um, uh, and orchestral pieces and a part of her with Christopher Gable as the principal dancer every week male dancer and a ballerina from all over the world, um, a different ballerina would come and they would do a pas de deux. So I, I, I was only 21, I think, and I, uh, 21, 22, and I used to go and get drunk with him at clubs in the evening because um, uh, uh, he liked women. He, he was very, he was a very, he enjoyed life and he enjoyed nightclubs, etc. So we really hit the town, uh, and I got to know him quite well. And eventually, when we got to, when it came 14 years later to casting this piece, um, I suddenly thought of. Ballet dancer, great physique. He has a fantastic voice, and he's now an actor because he'd now become a film star. So I asked John if we should go down that road, and he said, "Well, try him because he's a huge name." So I rang him. I had his number. So I rang Christopher and said, "I'm going to. I'd love you to do a Doctor Who part." And told him about it, and said, "You don't get seen at all. You will never see who you are." Blah blah. blah and discussed the whole thing with him, and he just said, "Look, send the script to me." Um, I'm thrilled that you're thinking about me, but send the script. I'm not sure. It's not something I'm desperate to do, I don't think. Um, but he read the script, and the next day he rang me, or when he sent it to him, and the next day he rang and said, I would love to come and talk to you seriously about this, um, and if you know, we can agree on certain things, I'm absolutely certain I'll be doing this. And he did. He agreed to do it, and, um, and then we got this fabulous performance. And Peter, is a... Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, I was, I was just going to say about... Uh, about uh, um, um, uh, uh, Graham, that he, I was going to say he was a breath of fresh air. He was more like a hurricane of fresh air. <laughs> uh, um, because he came in, uh, and it was my last story, and uh, it had been going pretty well the third season, but he just had such a different approach to it, um, which I must admit, at first, I, I thought, this man's nuts. This, this won't work. He can't do this shot here. He can't, uh, I, I got quite used to figuring out you know, where shots would be in the normal way of shooting Doctor Who. And he would do bizarre things, like you'd have a camera handheld at one point, I remember, and, and then you, you cross the line, and, could, and I kept thinking, it's not going to work. And then you just managed to infuse us, and carry. And we were all swept along in this extraordinary kind <laughs> of Graham Harper whirlwind of, uh, of, of, of brilliance. And, and the cast, uh, not only Christopher Gable, but I, I, you know, I thought John Normington yeah. was fantastic in it, Morris Reeves was, was great. It was a terrific cast and what was brilliant about it was it was not only a kind of a more immediate and more almost naturalistic way of doing it it was also in contrast also the very theatrical I mean there's nothing more brilliant than John Normington's asides which worked fantastically well but were very theatrical in the way it was done and I just thought it was for me it was such a fantastic uh, story to go out on for every reason but most of all for, 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 for Graham. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, it's very nice of you. Thank you. I have to say, actually, I've, um, I've not seen Case of Andrzejny before, and in fact, after I left Doctor Who, I didn't watch any of these stories. <laughs> Maybe I was having a half. Um, um, so I watched that completely fresh, and what you both said was so apparent to me. It looked so different from anything that I had done connected to Doctor Who. It had a completely different feel to it. It, it looked like it had moved on leaps and bounds, the whole thing, since I'd left. And it wasn't really that long but it, I thought it looked great. Um, obviously it's a big decision to make to, to decide to move on from a show that is so popular as Doctor Who um, and one suggestion has been that Patrick Troughton said to you don't do more than three years I don't know whether that's true, true or not did. Um, but, true, yeah. but was that an influence or what was the, what, what was the decision? It, it was I would say more a confirmation than an influence uh, I, I had done a um, previous series for either three years or three seasons and it seemed to me long enough but not too long um, <clears throat> and I hadn't really been that happy with my second season for various reasons, uh, budgetary mostly, uh, and the, the you know, foibles of the BBC. But um, I think probably, had, ironically, had my third season been my second season, I had to make the decision at the end of the second season. I may well have stayed longer. But um, I think I, I was, once I'd made the decision, John asked me to make the decision in about, I think I had about three or four days to think about it before he need, absolutely needed an answer. And once I made the decision to go, it was, it was a great relief. I felt like I'd made the right decision. Making the decision to move on is entirely different from moving on in that last story. I mean, there is something truly painful, <laughs> and I don't mean this <laughs> in an unpleasant way, than seeing Colin Baker come in and li lie down uh, <laughs> in, in your place, because you're kind, it, it is a terrible, because, He's queuing up there, ready to... Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, and I know that uh, D David Tennant felt the same way. He made a decision to move on, but then it, it was very difficult when it comes to it. Because deep in, down, down in your subconscious, there's the thought that they can't possibly continue after me, can they? I mean, <laughs> surely they'll just have to stop the programme. Um, but of course they don't. Uh, and so I, I remember the actual e evening when we were doing the, the, the scene, the regeneration scene, was very, very... It was sort of traumatic. And what was the atmosphere between you and Colin Baker? I mean, oh, did, did, that did was you, fine. Did, oh, he was did you offer any words of advice or anything? No, no, because I hadn't heard Tom's word as, words of advice to me, so there was little point in handing any on to Colin. Um, <laughs> um, no, I didn't. I, I, he seemed very, very uh, um, confident about what he was going to do with it, so I, um, so I left him to it. But we, it, there was no... It was, he's a nice bloke, Colin, and he'd already, he'd already shot me once, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we were old friends.